Hello photographers. Let's talk about the Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II. The EM1 Mark II was the first micro four thirds camera with a $2,000 price point, which was a subject of a lot of discussion. But this camera was pretty quickly followed up by the Panasonic GH5, which is the second micro four thirds camera that sells for $2,000. Now the EM1 Mark II is the second Olympus micro four thirds camera that uses a 20 megapixel sensor. And like the EM5 Mark II and the Pen F, it does not have an anti-aliasing filter on that sensor. It's got a fully articulating three inch, 1.37 million dot LCD touchscreen, and it has a 2.37 million dot viewfinder with a 0.74x magnification. The body itself weighs 1.27 pounds with the new BLH1 1720 milliamp battery. So this is the first Micro Four Thirds camera that has dual SD card slots, though only one of these slots is UHS-2 compatible. The magnesium alloy body is dust, splash, and freeze proof and can operate in temperatures ranging from 14 degrees Fahrenheit to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. It has an ISO range of 200 to 25,600 and it can shoot up to 60 frames per second when using the electronic shutter. It has built-in Wi-Fi and it has Olympus's very, very good in-body five-axis image stabilization. In fact, it's rated for up to 5.5 stops of stabilization and it has a whole bunch of other features. Those include built-in HDR, 50 megapixel high resolution mode, time-lapse mode with in-body movie creation, live composite mode, and a whole bunch more. The EM1 Mark II is meant to be a professional camera. Now what professional means will be argued until the end of time, but a few of the key features that puts this camera in the pro realm are the dual SD card slots, the 60 frames per second burst mode, the 4K stabilized video, and the headphone and microphone jacks. Overall, I really like the design of this camera, though I will say I think it's a bit ugly, mostly because of this significant grip. However, this grip is ugly in all of the right ways. First of all, it makes holding the camera incredibly comfortable and it makes room for the new BLH1 1750 milliamp battery. This battery is 530 milliamps larger than the EM1's battery and the extra power is very welcome. The EM1 Mark II also weighs more than its predecessor, but not by a huge amount, just 2.72 ounces. Now on the front, we have the monster grip, the two customizable buttons, a PC sync port, and of course the lens release. On top we have the power switch which surrounds the customizable HDR button and the combo autofocus metering mode button. Then we have the flash hot shoe, the lockable mode dial, the rear control dial, the customizable record and multifunction buttons, and the front control dial which surrounds the shutter button. On the back across the top we have the customizable view selector button, the viewfinder, the AEL AFL switch which is surrounded by a customizable lever, and way over on the far right is the customizable focus point selection button. Underneath that is the fully articulating touchscreen which I love, and to the right we have the info button button, directional pad, menu, trash, and image review buttons. All in all, this camera is beautifully designed. The only thing I would change would be to change the location of the HDR and combo AF metering buttons and the mode dial. I prefer to have all my buttons easily accessible while I'm holding the camera. And with these buttons here, I've got to take my hand off of the lens to use them. To me, the mode dial makes perfect sense on the top left plate because once your mode is set, you pretty much don't need to access the dial. The upside is that with the level of customization this camera offers, it isn't really a big deal because you can easily program these functions to buttons over here on the right or whatever other functions you want over here. So let's talk about the image quality. This is the second Olympus camera to feature a 20 megapixel sensor. And many people are concerned about the limitations of the 4 3rd sensor size and the ability to keep adding megapixels while maintaining image quality. And with more megapixels, the biggest question is how good is this camera in low light? In short, it's damn good. It's so good that I'd happily shoot this at ISO 12,800 all day long if the lighting called for it. Of course, I took the camera out for my patent pending bar band test and I was just blown away by it. These samples are all shot at ISO 12,800 and they just look amazing.
The noise has a very natural and pleasing pattern to it, and in my opinion, this camera can easily be shot at high ISOs. Now, while I was out, I did forget to shoot at ISO 25,600, so I took some test photos here at home, and I definitely shoot the EM-1 at 25,600 if I needed to. There is some banding going on in the shadows, as well as some hot pixels, but color noise is managed very well, and I take images at 25,600 over no images at all. So if it's this good at higher ISOs, then we know that the quality is going to be great overall. And here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is a straight out of the camera shot from a photo shoot I did with body painter Otto Ott and model Alyssa Ramos. This was shot in RAW, imported into Lightroom, and then exported as a JPEG with no adjustments, and it's beautiful. The details are beautiful, the colors are beautiful, Alyssa is beautiful, I mean everything is just superb. And for you pixel peepers, just look at this detail. This is a 300% zoom. Now go ahead and pause the video if you want to counter eyelashes. Now this is the same image with some basic Lightroom adjustments made, and the adjustments really make the image sing. So we know the image quality is fantastic, which quite frankly isn't all that surprising, but some of you were wondering about the dynamic range, so I put that to the test as well. First, I took this same image and reset it to undo all of my basic adjustments. Then I increased the exposure by one stop, took the shadows to plus 100, and pulled the highlights back to minus 85, and set the contrast to 20. On zooming into the shadow areas, we can see that there was more than enough dynamic range to recover a ton of color and detail. And this isn't precise, but I'd estimate that to be a two to two and a half stop adjustment of the shadow areas with great recovery and range. Then to see how far I could push it, I turned on the highlights clipping warning, set the highlight recovery to minus 100, and pushed the exposure up until I started to see clipping, which started at plus three stops. So with just that, we can see that there's an impressive range and versatility to these raw files. Now after that, I did a different dynamic range test where I backlit a tea canister and I took a series of photos, starting with an exposure value of zero and moving in one stop increments to an exposure value of negative five. Then I took the photos into Lightroom and increased the exposure of the four underexposed images so that all exposures matched, and then I compared the images. In my opinion, the range of these RAW files is really impressive. At up to three stops, I saw very little noise and very little loss of quality, and even at four and five stops, the recovery is impressive. Now, in the four and five stop files, there is a strong redshift to the image from the color noise, which is noticeable in the three stop image, but is much more pronounced in the four and five stop images. You also start to get a bit of banding in the noise at four and five stops. And all of this is unscientific, but I'd say that you can easily get three stops of recovery out of these raw files. And depending on the amount of work you want to put into your images, you could push it all the way to five stops and still get a great image. Now, one other thing I want to touch on is the 50 megapixel high resolution shot. This mode is just like the high resolution mode on the EM5 Mark II. The only difference is that the EM5 Mark II has a 16 megapixel sensor as compared to the EM1 Mark II's 20 megapixel sensor. That resolution difference gives you a 50 megapixel high resolution image instead of the 40 megapixel image of the EM5 Mark II. And in terms of quality, it's fantastic. And one of the really cool things about this high resolution shot mode is that you can capture the final image in RAW. But as of right now, Lightroom can't read the high resolution RAW files. It can read the regular RAW files, but if you do the high resolution shot as RAW, you have to process it with the Olympus Viewer 3 software. And like pretty much all manufacturer RAW converter software options, Olympus Viewer 3 kind of sucks. The good thing is that Lightroom does support the high resolution RAW files from the EM5 Mark II, so it seems likely that they'll add support for the high resolution RAWs from the EM1 Mark II. One of the things Olympus is working on is making it possible to use that high resolution mode while hand holding the camera. And while this mode operates the same as on the EM5 Mark II, there have been improvements made to the process that help get this closer to that goal. But for now, the high resolution shot is still limited to still subjects with the camera mounted on a tripod. So to sum it up in a sentence, the image quality of the EM1 Mark II is awesome. Now speaking of the in-body image stabilization, the EM1 Mark II is rated for up to five and a half stops of stabilization. Image stabilization is great for shooting longer shutter speeds of still subjects while still giving you sharp photos, allowing you to shoot below the reciprocal rule shutter speed for your lens. And I've got to tell you, 
this is pretty fantastic. I was able to regularly shoot one second shutter speeds hand holding the camera, which is pretty incredible. Now it's not perfect and you won't get one second shutter speeds in every situation. So to tax the limits of the stabilization, I set up my little sculpture, I zoomed the lens out to 40 millimeters and I tried to hand hold at different shutter speeds for a close up shot. Because I was shooting close up, camera shake was magnified and that limited me to one tenth of a second. Now that's still very good, but the farther away you are from the subject and the wider the focal length you use, the better your stabilization will be. Now let's talk about the autofocus. The EM1 Mark II has on-sensor contrast detect autofocus with 121 focus points that cover a good majority of the frame. Choosing a focus point is nice and easy. You can either hit the customizable focus point button or hit any one of the directional pad buttons to bring up the focus point selector grid. You can then use the directional pad or the two control dials to select your desired focus point and you can do all of this without having to remove your eye from the viewfinder. Now with your eye to the viewfinder, you can also use the new touchscreen focus point selection mode. This allows you to drag your thumb across the LCD screen while using the viewfinder to very quickly change your focus point. I love this feature, but I also ended up disabling it. I love it because it makes choosing your focus point fast and easy. All you gotta do is run your finger along the back screen. But the reason I disabled it was because it kept registering my nose as my thumb and moving the focus point when I didn't want it moved. Now this happened mostly when I was shooting in portrait orientation as when I hold the camera in landscape orientation my nose doesn't really rest on the screen. But it was enough of a problem that I ended up disabling the feature and went back to traditional focus point selection using the directional pad. I'm not sure if it's possible to distinguish between a nose and a thumb, but one solution that could work for this would be to make only the upper right corner of the screen active for focus point selection. This is an area that you're unlikely to hit with your nose no matter how you're holding the camera. Now in terms of the focus performance itself, it's blazing fast. I immediately noticed a difference between the focus speed of my EM5 Mark II and the EM1 Mark II, and the EM5 Mark II is no slouch. And it's not just the speed, the accuracy is also fantastic. Fantastic. And when using traditional single shot autofocus, I had no problems focusing in any lighting conditions at all. But the real question is how good is this camera at tracking focus? And in this, it's also very good. To test it, I took the camera to a high school basketball game and shot for a good couple of hours, and I was very happy with the result. Initially, I didn't do any optimizations and was getting decent results with a hit rate of around 50%, which you can see in this sequence. And for this sequence, I was using continuous autofocus with tracking and low speed burst mode. With some optimizations, the results get much, much better. Here's a sequence using the high speed burst mode and continuous autofocus without tracking. I also activated the five central focus points and in this sequence, nearly every shot was successfully tracked and in focus. Now, I found the best results came with regular continuous autofocus instead of tracking focus. And the reason for this is that the tracking focus has a tendency to jump away from the subject you want to track, while with continuous focus, as long as you keep your focus points on the subject, the camera will work to keep that subject in focus. All in all, I found the tracking focus to be excellent, and while I can't compare this to the D500, which is something it really needs to be compared to, I can tell you that it's hands down the best Micro Four Thirds camera for shooting sports, wildlife, and action, and I'd happily put this camera to use for shooting the MMA fights that I shoot. I know that with this camera, I'd get more keepers than I do with the EM5 Mark II because not only is the tracking excellent, but the burst capabilities and raw buffer are also excellent. The EM1 Mark II has broken some new ground with its burst capabilities, but selecting the right modes for the burst performance you want is a bit confusing. The camera can shoot at an insane 60 frames per second raw with the focus locked using the electronic shutter. And you can access that by choosing the silent continuous high mode, which is denoted with a heart. Now if you choose the normal continuous high mode, you'll be shooting at 15 frames per second using the full mechanical shutter and both focus and exposure will be locked. If you choose silent continuous low, again denoted by the heart, then you'll get the 18 frames per second with autofocus and auto exposure. 
And if you choose normal continuous low, you'll be shooting at 10 frames per second with autofocus and auto exposure. Finally, you have the Pro Capture High and Pro Capture Low modes, which combine the 18 and 60 frame per second burst modes with the in camera buffer to start taking photos before you actually take the photo. How it works is when you half press the button to obtain focus, the camera starts saving the photos being read out from the image sensor. It saves up to 14 photos in the buffer, continuously discarding the older photos as new ones are added. And it keeps buffering this way until you press the shutter button to take the actual photo. But you cannot buffer perpetually. If you haven't taken a photo after one minute, the camera will stop buffering. To restart, you'll need to release the shutter button and then half press it to obtain focus again. And the theory here is that if you're too slow on the shutter button, the buffer will have the photo you actually wanted to capture because it was already there. Now these burst capabilities are both a blessing and a curse because with these insane burst rates, you have to be strategic with how you shoot. The speed of these cameras is important, but the speed isn't nearly as important as your ability to know what action you want to capture and to focus your shooting on those moments. If you aren't careful, you'll end up with tens of thousands of photos that are gonna be mostly junk. And yes, the sheer volume of those photos will give you some keepers, but you'll still have to wade through thousands and thousands of photos to find the one or two good ones. And one last thing to keep in mind with these burst modes, the EM-1 Mark II has two SD card slots, but only one of them is UHS-2 compatible. And while the buffer on the EM-1 Mark II is quite large, even with the UHS-2 slots, it takes a bit of time to clear those photos out of the buffer. While the buffer is clearing, you can continue to operate the camera, you can use the menus, you can take photos, but you can't review any images until the buffer is fully clear. Bottom line, the burst modes are impressive and definitely useful, but in my opinion, it's the much improved autofocus and tracking abilities that make this camera well suited to sports, wildlife, and other action. On to the video. The EM-1 Mark II is another step forward for Olympus as far as video capabilities go. The EM-5 Mark II was the first camera where you could say Olympus started taking video seriously and the EM-1 Mark II built on top of that. The EM-1 Mark II can shoot cinema 4K at 24 frames per second with a data rate of 237 megabits per second. It can also shoot regular 4K at 30, 25, and 24 frames per second and that has a data rate of 102 megabits per second. For 1080p, it can shoot 30, 30, 25, and 24 frames per second, and that data rate is at 202 megabits per second, but it can also shoot 1080p at 60 and 50 frames per second, but the data rate there is limited to 52 megabits per second. And finally, it can shoot 720p at a whole bunch of different frame rates, and that data rate is 102 megabits per second. You have full access to the in-body image stabilization for all of those resolutions up to and including the Cinema 4K, and you've also got a microphone jack with levels control, and you've got a headphone jack for audio monitoring. And in terms of image quality and sound quality, you can judge for yourself because this portion of the video is recorded with the EM-1 Mark II in 4K being downscaled to 1080p. Now, if you want to peep some full cinema 4K, you can click the card up here for a sample. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I think the quality is absolutely fantastic, including in low light. Now, the max ISO available while shooting in video is 6400. For the samples, we're going to start at ISO 1600. And here you can see there's noise, but in my opinion, it's not bad at all. When we jump to 3200, the noise is much more prevalent. And I know some of you are probably thinking that there's no way you'd shoot at 3200, but take a look at this other sample here. Because this is a more typical video sample with a subject, with movement, with a foreground and a background. And with all of that going on, the noise fades away as you focus on the content of the video rather than the noise itself. And the same goes for shooting in ISO 6400. When you look at a static video, it looks pretty terrible. But if you shoot a more typical shot with a subject to focus on, the noise isn't so present because you're focused on the content. It is definitely still noticeable. And I know some of you won't agree with me, but I would definitely shoot this at ISO 6400. I'd have no problem with that. Now, in terms of the stabilization, you have no stabilization in-body image stabilization, and then in-body combined with digital stabilization. And as you can see from the side-by-side -side test, the in-body is really, really good, but you can still see some walking movement from camera shake, but when you combine it with digital, it's awesome. So all in all, I think the stability is great, and I think the video features on the EM-1 are really, really fantastic, making this a well-rounded camera for both still and video shooters.
Now, there are a bunch of other features that Olympus cameras share, like the live composite, the Wi-Fi implementation, and much more. And those are all basically the same as on the EM5 Mark II, which is to say that they're really great. I'm not going to go into huge detail here. If you want detail on those features, check out my EM5 Mark II review video, and that'll cover them for you. All in all, I think the OMD EM1 Mark II is a fabulous camera, and if I needed a new camera right now, I would definitely buy one of these. And the truth is, I want to buy one, I just don't really need one. If shooting the MMA fights and other sports and action were an integral part of my photography, I would buy this camera right now. But for the work that I do, my EM5 Mark II is a champ, and I don't really need to upgrade. And honestly, I think that's really the best wrap-up I can give you because I, I really want to buy this camera. It's really good in image quality, in ISO performance, in video quality and options. The design is great. The stabilization is amazing. It is the ultimate Olympus OMD camera. And in my opinion, this is the best Micro Four Thirds camera you can get. And if you're considering this camera, do yourself a favor and just buy it. If you shoot sports and you are looking for a camera, the EM1 Mark II should definitely be on your list. And if you're looking for the best and most well-rounded Micro Four Thirds camera out there, stop looking because this is it. Now, if you have any questions about the EM1 Mark II or photography in general, let me know down in the comments. And then do me a favor, would you like this video and subscribe to my channel? And if you really like this video, please share it with your friends. But the most important thing you need to do is get out there and take some damn photos with whatever camera you have. I'll see you guys tomorrow on the live show. Hello, photographers. Let's talk. Hello, photographers. It's gonna be one of those days. Thank you for watching. Now, I get loads of questions and they all boil down to one thing, which is how do I make my camera do what I want it to do? And here's the thing, your camera is like an instrument and you can't make music if you can't play your instrument. If you want to learn how to play your camera like the instrument it is, visit this link right here to check out my guide to shooting in manual mode video course.